All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of the Mike New Haven podcast, episode 92. If you haven't checked out the previous episode, it was a lot of fun. We continued the miniseries Tales from the Boom Room, profiles of the NYPD's arson and explosion and bomb squad with retired NYPD bomb squad detective Jim Carano, who did 14 years in the bomb squad, uh, 1992 to 2006, was the range training officer. Interesting guy and a really nice guy. So for those of you that will listen to this, uh, this uh, episode that I'll be recording today will be airing on Thursday. Uh, the episode with Jim Carano will be airing Tuesday evening at six o'clock. And again, uh, Jim was a great guy. You're really going to enjoy uh, hearing his stories. If you haven't heard, by the time you're hearing this, of course, you'll have heard his stories already. So you'll like them a lot. And I'm sure you'll like my next guest, too, who uh, for 20 years was a, had a front row seat to some of the greatest theater anyone could see in New York City. He joined the NYPD in 1982. And the next 20 years would see him do and accomplish a lot. Beginning his career in the 70th Precinct, located out in Brooklyn, he'd go on to work in Manhattan and later in arguably the NYPD's best unit, no disrespect to all the other great units out there, the Emergency Service Unit, working in both Truck 1 and Truck 2, located in different parts of Manhattan. He'd get a very good glimpse at all the craziness Manhattan can throw a cop's away. Retiring in 2002, he's still active, currently serving as the Director of uh, Physical Security and the Private Sector. And of course, that is retired uh, NYPD Sergeant John Lampkin, who joins me now on the Mike Newman podcast. John, pleasure to have you. Welcome. How are you? Thanks, Mike. I'm doing well. Appreciate you having me here. No, no problem. I heard a lot of great things about you, particularly when our mutual friend Paul Pericone was on this show as part of uh, my Bomb Squad miniseries. I said, you know what? I ought to reach out to Mr. Lampkin and here you are. And so uh, here we go. So first question is always an easy one. Uh, Your formative years, where'd you grow up and what was your childhood like? Sure. So I was uh, born and raised in Brooklyn, Brooklyn, New York, Marine Park, um, son of a uh, policeman and the grandson of a fireman. So I kind of get, uh, you know, I've, I've hit them both, basically. Um, Marine Park was a, a blue collar uh, neighborhood um, and, you know, just a lot of cops, firemen. Um, I went to school in Good Shepherd um, Grammar School. I did eight years there and then I went off to a, I did uh, my first year in St. Agnes High School. It was a, uh, a Jesuit school on 44th and uh, between Lexington and 3rd. Um, I did about a year there and then I decided I didn't want to do the commuting anymore. So I went to James Madison High School. Where I graduated um, high school there. So I have um, a sister who retired out of Bronx Lawrence and I have another sister who's, uh, she works for a consulting firm up in uh, Marblehead. And I have a brother who's a registered nurse. Oh, so, so working in the civil service field definitely runs in the family, to say the least. Yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Um, it's, it's, my father did uh, 31 years. Um, he retired in uh, 1986. So I was able to spend uh, four years uh, working on the job while he was still on the job. That's nice. And, you know, you always find that a lot, too. It's, it's not an uncommon thing to where, you know, for the cops and the firemen in New York City, uh, the dad or even the mom sometimes was on the job. And, and so that kind of inculcates it in you early on. So I, I guess that foregoes the question I was going to ask you, what attracted you to the job? So getting to the point of taking the test, did you take both tests or did you just take the police test? I just took the police test. Um, it was, uh, I, you know, you know, talking to my father, well, interesting. So in graduating um, high school, and I guess back then in, in a time graduating high school, 1977, I'll date myself. Um, most of my group um, was, they, not too many were going to off to college. You know, so everybody was basically either going to go to, you know, some sort of trades or, you know, construction, iron workers, uh, electricians, cops are fine. We did have a few that went off into, uh, into college. So I went and um, I started working actually on Wall Street. Um, and I was working, I was an assistant to the over-the-counter desk at first I started at Morgan Stanley. And then I was off into Dean Witter when I got called for the police department. But it was always something that I wanted to do. Um, you know, so I was fortunate. I was able to make that switch. Um, and, um, you know, it, as my father said back then, you know, you're not going to make a lot of money, but you're going to make uh, lifetime friends. And that's true on both occasions <laughs> that you, you don't make a lot of money, but you do make some lifetime, lifelong friends. Like you mentioned, uh, Paul Pericone's one. I know Jimmy Carano, um, another one. Uh, so most of the, most of the people that I've, I've heard you on your podcast, I've kind of known. Yeah, you know, and that's that's the great thing about it about this show is that uh, you you reach out and you get the chance to hear so many great stories, and and I love bl- being a fly on the wall to this stuff because you know, listen, I, I guess you can describe me as a buff. I wasn't on the job. I have family and friends that have been on both jobs, fire and police. Um, but to get the inside perspective on what's my favorite city in the world and what it was like to work the job for both departments in that city. 
it's a really great thing. And, and that's why, of course, I'm glad those guys have been on. They're great guys, as you know, and I'm glad that uh, you're here too. We're talking with John Lampkin here in the Mike Game Podcast, retired NYPD sergeant. So your first stop was the 70th precinct out of Brooklyn. I feel like a lot of the cops I've had on this podcast and firemen too have started out in Brooklyn or at least worked a long time in that borough. And, you know, it has a lot. I mean, especially in the 80s, yep. you know, I'm, I'm sure it kept you quite busy. So coming out of the academy, going to the 7 0. Uh, which part of Brooklyn for my listeners that may not be geographically familiar with New York city was this and how busy were you on a given shift? Okay. So um, just to back up. So I, I did spend a little time in what's called the NSU 10 neighborhood stabilization unit um, number 10. So when we, when I was in the Academy, that Academy class was 3000 people. Um, so that in itself, just the, the Academy alone was an interesting thing. And there was, you know, I have to give credit there. So there were three instructors. My instructor was uh, Police officer Fira Mosca, who eventually he would, he ends up getting promoted while I'm in the academy. Sergeant Fira Mosca, fantastic guy. Cesar Aponte and um, Detective Borman. Those are my formulative people. Um, and they, they, in each of them, had given me something that I used over the next 20 years. One of the nice things that uh, Sergeant Fira Mosca said to us, he said, "Don't make this your life. Have something else other than this job," which I've always taken that with me. Because you can see sometimes it can consume people if that became, you know, your, your life thing. So anyway, so I, I, we, we leave the academy. I go to NSU 10. And what they were going to do, there was a pilot program back then. They were going to take the top percent of the academic class and they were going to send them right to commands. Typical police department, that plan got put off to a couple of weeks. So I go to NSU 10. NSU 10 consisted of the 6-1, the 6-2, um, the 6-0, which is Coney Island, and the 7-0. Um, while I was there, one of the training officers was Louis Miller. Louis Miller, um, fantastic human being. He, he ends up gets killed in 1987. I think he was 63 years old, 34 years on the job. And he always taught us, he, we were his kids. Um, and again, I was very fortunate enough to be able to spend some time with him prior to this. So I, I do the four weeks at NSU 10, and then I go to the 7-0. Now the 7-0, it's, um, it, it, it encompasses uh, Prospect Park a lot of Ocean Parkway. And right at that time, there's a thing that was called co-terminality. And co-terminality was the redesigning of some precincts. So within a year, we ended up picking up part. We shifted over to Church Avenue, to Flatbush Avenue. We picked up part of what was the 6-7 and some of the 7-1, which we became a lot more busier. Early on in you know, the 7-0 in Brooklyn South, it was kind of a, more of a slow house. It got very busy. Um, so going there um, and... It was very interesting. So you, you, you go within four weeks of coming out of the academy. You know, I was standing on, in Brighton Beach. I was in Coney Island. And next thing I know, I'm on Avenue J on a midnight saying, what am I doing here? You know, and it's just it's just the nature of kind of what the job is. Um, so going there, a lot of great people. I met a lot of, uh, you know, actually Joe Fox and um, Mike Collins were, um, were cops. They were the anti-crime team when I got there. And Joe Fox, as you know, he's, he kind of rose to the three star. Mike was a, a deputy chief, a deputy commissioner. Um, two great, two great people. Absolutely. And, you know, for my listeners, you mentioned Detective Lewis Miller. Lewis Miller was instrumental in training a lot of cops over the years. He uh, was shot and killed in the line of duty in 1987, responding to a robbery in Manhattan. Uh, when he responded, a shootout erupted and, and he was struck and killed. I believe the, the, one of the detectives that arrested uh, Detective Miller's killers uh, is somebody who will actually be on the show soon, and that's Detective Phil Grimaldi, who retired out of the intelligence division in, in 2003. I don't know if you know him, but uh, Phil, I, I think he caught that case pretty early in his career as a detective. So, you know, community policing has always been something. I had this conversation with Chief Animal when he was on. Uh, community policing has always been uh, an interesting topic because every neighborhood is different, so there's a different way to implement it. In Brooklyn at that time, especially when the crack craze was going on and, and that's consuming a lot of neighborhoods, not just the ones you worked in, how did community policing, how, how was it worked in your particular area? Um, what's well, interesting, so... I would say back in when I was in the 7 0 from 82 to 85, then I get transferred to another interesting story. I go to transfer to Midtown North. Um, there was a what called a, a community a CPOP car, and it was one sector. And what they did was that was the sector that was a steady sector, a steady car, and they were to try to, you know, um, I guess the early stages of community policing. But for, for the most part, we were. 
we were still coming out of um, the cutbacks from 75. They were still understaffed. You would go out, you know, sometimes you'd have two, maybe three cars on the midnights, maybe two. So the idea of to be able to really implement community policing where you can put a cop on like almost every beat, it wasn't that much there at that time. It developed, it, it evolves. And certainly, you know, we fast forward to the time when I was a sergeant in the 7-5 and I was doing the, um, I had a SNU team, which is a street narcotics enforcement unit. And we would meet the community on, you know, when they would have the community meetings and we would address their issues. They'd say, hey, listen, you know, at this corner, there's, this is going on. They would give us the intel and we would go out and, and we would look to do the enforcement on that. End. And that's, that's key because, I mean, obviously, you, everybody in the community wants to be able to live peaceably to a reasonable extent. Mm-hmm. And it goes a long way when you can trust the person that's tasked with getting a bad person off the street to say, hey, this is going on and I would like you to stop it. So, because I mean, a lot of people are hesitant to approach, it, especially you find that with youth, you know, and, and my situation was different because, you know, a lot of, as I said earlier, a lot of friends and family are, are members of the job. So it was easy for me. I never felt that intimidation, but some youth feel that intimidation. So, or anybody, it doesn't have to be youth particularly. And so to have that rapport, Um, it's important. And obviously it went a long way towards getting some pretty dangerous people off the streets. And so speaking of dangerous from Brooklyn, we go to Manhattan and Midtown North in the 1980s was an interesting place to be. Uh, What prompted the transfer? Um, Lieutenant George Congo, Lieutenant George Congo was a a Lieutenant in the seven Oh, very interesting man. And um, on Saturdays he would, you know, sometimes I would drive him and we, I kid you not, we would go up and down Coney Island Avenue and he would stop in the antique stores. He loved antiques. So we weren't busy. He'd go in. And I guess uh, Lieutenant Cargo had over 20 years on. And he said, you know, you, you're what, 23, 24 years old. Um, what do you, why are you here? Why don't you go to Manhattan? You know, you're a single guy, go to Manhattan and see what it's like. So I did, uh, and my father was still on the job. And, you know, and naturally as the job is, you know, you, you sometimes you need a little push to get places and a little juice. So I went back to him and I said, hey, what about going to Midtown North? And he doesn't say anything, which is where I, it, it's not until I get there that I realized that I go to the premier precinct in all of um, the police department. It's called Fort Hook. You're only a phone call away. And it's um, when I get there, and I did get there in 1988, and I look around and I see, isn't that Chief so and so son? Isn't that Chief? So-? Yep, yep, yep. So, um, but going there was, was a completely different thing. It was, you know, you truly were on Broadway. Um, I ended up working uh, with some great people there. One of my first sergeants was uh, Jack Burton. Um, and Jack Burton retires as a lieutenant out of canine. And he, he ran the theater squad. And um, I was able to get into the theater squad, which is basically I had a steady foot post for two and a half years on 45th to 48th Street on 8th Avenue. And, um, and we took care of uh, all the theaters. And, and that's truly there was some community policing. You know, you got to know all the shops, you got to know all the, you know, everybody there. And, and it was, you were, you were only blocks away from 42nd Street. 42nd Street was not turned into Disney yet. It was still back in the day of 42nd Street. And there was both, you had crime, you had, um, you know, uh, you know, visitors coming in, tourists coming in, you had shows. You, you would be on a street corner like 42nd or 45th Street when the theaters broke and you'd have 10,000 people in the street in an hour and you have the one cop and you're, you know, you're responsible for everything. So it was, it was good. It was busy. It wasn't crazy busy. Um, but it was, but it was a lot of fun. You were truly were, you know, in, in the center of it all in midtown Manhattan. There used to be this scheme that they would do in Manhattan. I don't know if it was in your neck of, of where you were patrolling, but I, it kind of made sense given the fact people were going to theaters and some people have more money than others that uh, these guys would like bump into, it would, they would have like broken glass in their jacket and they would bump into somebody on purpose and say, you broke my bottle of wine. And they would right. make that yep. person go and get them a, a, a brand spanking new bottle of wine, even though it was just broken glass to begin with. Did they, were they pulling that scheme where you were patrolling? I don't know if you remember that. They did similar things like that. What a lot of time they would do up on 47th Street, the Diamond District, mm-hmm. they would do things like that as to, you know, and there was one, I believe that they had what was, you know, they would have a fake baby and then they would go and stumble and the baby would come and they would go to grab it. And then they would go and they would grab their, you know, whatever pocket they have, their jewels and diamonds, 
and uh, they would do things like that. So there was a lot of pickpockets. Um, that was one of the biggest things uh, that we had going down there. People go in the show and they put they go into a restaurant and put the handbag over the over the chair, and uh, so that was uh, that was a frequent occasion. Um, so it was, it was very different from going from where you know from the seven zero where we had more shootings to going over there where you don't, but you have more, um, you know, just, you know, just a different level of, uh, of criminality at the time. I believe you got the chance to work Central Park for a while, or at least around Central Park too, for a little bit of time. Well, I did when I was up in, um, when I got to two truck. Um, and then we had the, we had the run of the whole, you know, really kind of the whole city from after I left uh, Midtown North in 88 and I was able to get into uh, ESU. So, we did the, the trainings out at Floyd Bennett Field. So back when I did the training, it was only six weeks. Um, currently today, it's six months. So what they would do is you would do your six weeks. By the time it was all done, so they, they would send you out. And then if there was a spot open for your EMT cl- class, they'd bring you back in. That'd be another three weeks. The same thing with scuba certification. They'd bring you, you know, wherever you did your diving, they would, they would bring you back. Now what they've done is just made it all one shot. You know, so you, you go down there and you do it. Um, but two truck was, again, was, was just great. Um, had uh, from 57th Street up to the George Washington Bridge um, and water to water. And it was, you had the run of it all and you, you police, you know, you responded to everything that happened there as well as citywide. Um, you know, because there was, you, you may have four guys working in one truck and four guys working in two truck. Something happens, you're going to, they're going to respond up, but you're going to respond down. So we'll backpedal for a second before we dive deeper into your ESU tenure. How, I know you mentioned doing the training at Floyd Bennett Field, which is a requirement for all E-men and women. Uh, how did the opportunity to join ESU open up? Again, uh, <laughs> just kind of weird. We were standing around um, in Midtown North mm-hmm. and uh, my, my soon-to-be partner in emergency service, George Manning, was, he said, well, I'm going to um, take uh, an interview for ESU. And we're like, well, oh, that sounds good. I said, never really thought about it. And I go back to, you know, who? I go back to my dad. And I said, you know, what about going to uh, ESU? And he says, well, we did have a friend who was a, uh, a lieutenant there, Lieutenant Harrigan, Harrington. And he said, let me call him up and uh, let's see what it's about. You know, so I had, I had saw ESU on jobs. Um, I liked what they did. I thought they were consummate professionals. Um, so my father says, yeah, we got you an interview. So go see what they have. Um, so I was able to interview for it. And interesting. So when, when we interviewed back then, and, and basically what they told you, said, well, why do you want to come to a unit that's kind of a dead end? You're not going to get a gold shield out of this. You're going to get dirty. There's really no overtime. There's no kind of, you know, what are you going to bring here for it? And, you know, you know, if you look at it now and they're getting the recognition that they definitely deserve, but it's a career path. You know, you're in the issue now, 18 months, you get a gold shield. Back in the time when we first started it, it's like you, you're going to get dirty, you know, frustrated. You're not going to get much. Why? And, and yet we said, well, I want to do this. So. I think, and I, I could, there could be people that came before him, but uh, that, that kickstarted this trend. And if I missed them, then please tell me, because I don't want to forget them and leave them out. But the guy that really kind of made it cool to be a detective in ESU, from what I've read, and he'll, we'll talk about him later in the show, is Joe Vigiano. Because Joe was a guy, I mean, he worked out in Brooklyn. He got shot three times in the line of duty. He was working as a homicide detective mm-hmm. on, on one of the occasions. And he goes in the ESU. I mean, here's a guy that can go just about anywhere that has carte blanche because he's given so much and has nearly gotten killed on three separate occasions. And he goes to ESU where he has his gold shield. I think it was him that made it cool to, to go to, to a truck and, and get a gold shield. They, well, they were bringing them in. Um, even when I went there, it was basically one, one specialist detective shield per truck. So there's, you know, there's nine trucks. You only have nine of them. There's 250 people. So again, the career path wasn't there. Um, and Joe, and I know Joe and from the time when I was in the 7.5, um, and, and it was funny because he was, he was in the RIP unit as a white shield and he was getting his gold shield. And he said, well, I'm going to go to ESU. I go, you, you're on a career path, somewhere completely different. Why? But it was something that, that he always wanted to do him as well as uh, Mike Kurt, um, who was out there in the, in the 7.5 while I was out there as well. So working in truck two, uh, this is, this is Harlem. Uh, and this is, as you were, you're given the trajectory of it earlier, um, you know, you guys, as I mentioned, when I was introducing, you guys deal with a lot. I mean, if there's somebody that's threatening to jump, if there's uh, raids to be served on violent criminals, if there's just about car accidents, too, there's that. 
uh, this is again during the drug era and, and working in Harlem that was prevalent, unfortunately, back then. Um, just I, obviously there's a lot of excitement uh, to it because you never know which what each day was going to bring. But uh, take me through the procedural aspects for particularly we'll go through each one. But first, let's focus on serving a warrant. OK, I mean, uh, you know, back in back home when I was in there in um, as a cop prior to what they formulated was called the apprehension team. So the apprehension team comes later on um, where they just take a group of ESU guys and they do most of the warrants. So with that, we don't so we don't have that. So if you're going to get called to do a warrant in one particular case that uh, I think it was either. It was Manhattan North Narcotics or a DEA because they were doing felony weight. They were doing big weight. And I always remember, so we would do the tack up. We would get the truck and, you know, it, issue four, which is the supervisor, the city, super, citywide supervisor. We went to, I think it was Manhattan North, like, or it was up in the three, four. Again, not completely sure. But we, I remember being up in the, the meeting room and we're talking to the undercover. And the undercover just so caught blanche says, you know, well, here's the location. Here's the door. The last few buys, I walk in, you know, they put the gun to my head. We walk into the back, you know, we do the buy and we come out. And, you know, and I, I just sort of like stopped. They said, well, hold on a second. The part about you putting the gun to your head and you walk in, he goes, yeah, 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 that, that happens all the time, you know. But he, and, and I give this guy, these, these folks that do this kind of work so much credit. I'm there with a heavy vest. I have a ballistic shield. The guy behind me has a, has a submachine gun. And I'm hesitant about going in. But this guy went in. In, in a pair of shorts and a t-shirt. And, uh, and sure enough, when we hit the place, um, we hit the door, there's a guy running down the hall. He drops the gun that just moments before he put to, to this undercover's head to make this dry, this drug buy, which is, you know, again, um, my hat's off to these folks that do this on a daily basis. It's just, it's truly amazing. And it's, uh, you know, that's true bravery. That's heroes though. It is, and I, I made this joke. I, I had I made this joke with Jim Carano and, and Paul Perico when they were on for the Bomb Squad miniseries that if I had to put that bomb suit on and walk towards a suspicious package, I'd have an accident on myself. The same can be true for that because if it, just the mere threat, I don't think anybody has to put it to my head, but just the mere threat of uh, of that, would, you know, Mike, what's that smell? Oh, don't don't you know, oh, ignore that yeah. in my pants. <laughs> but uh, so that's that covers the raid aspect, and now I guess we'll get to okay. Let's just say I'm going through a rough time, and mental health is a big conversation nowadays, you know, and I, I'm, I'm saying, oh, I'm, I'm going to harm myself. You're in that situation. You have to talk me down. What would you tell me? Well, first thing I, I always says that, you know, what you're up here for, you know, what you're doing is you, you're, you're doing, it's a permanent solution to your temporary problems. And what we try to do is wants to, whoever got there first to try to establish that rapport, um, whatever it is. And then you, you just kind of continue with that. And things are, you know, I'll give you an example. When we were down in one truck, we were up on the top of the Brooklyn Bridge and um, Jerry Kutzler at the time says to the guy, um, hey, why don't you come in? We'll give you a hug. And the guy flips. He's like, that's why I'm up here. And so Jerry realized, OK, I'm not going to be the guy talking. So they left to me to talk to this individual to where we can get to the point where, you know, it was always to try to get to the point where one willingly would come in or you get close enough to make a grab. Um, so. Jack Cambria, who was very good at doing a lot of this, and you know, he's a he's another guy. If you don't have him on your list, get him on your list. Um, he's on my list. Up. He's busy right now, but he'll he'll hopefully yep, be on yep. at the beginning of next um, year. Jack Jack's a uh, very good friend, and and Jack actually got transferred. We were all sergeants. We all got transferred back into emergency together. Um, you know, Jack and I go back a, a long time. Fantastic guy, but it's just um, I think their their motto is talk to me, mm -hmm. um, and and it's and it's whether it's a hostage or a jumper or someone just in crisis. And it was always kind of the same, get the dialogue going, get it to the point where you can either intervene or they'll willingly come in and, and the issue will be resolved. And before we get to the last part, which is the car accidents uh, aspect of it, which we will focus on in a moment, because uh, it segues perfectly into the next question. Let's take it back to a documentary on ESU that was filmed in 1999 and 2000. This very scenario, a man's on the bridge. You're, I don't think you're in this clip, but it's a man on the bridge at the Triborough Bridge. He's high on uh, numerous substances and he's threatening to jump. And who but the NYPD's ESU? They're to talk him down. We have such a wide range of work in a city this big. Uh, last year alone, we responded to over 100,000 calls for assistance. It could be an emotionally distraught individual. It could be a person who is even trapped in a car. 
from a person trapped under a train, bridge rescues. A Triborough Bridge eastbound, a jumper up. Jump Friday up. evening, Manhattan's Triborough Bridge. The NYPD's elite emergency service unit responds to a suicidal individual threatening to jump. You can't uh, pin him down, right? It's a small catwalk. It's really hazardous to the guys. Oh, I see him now. Yeah, okay. 200 feet above the East River, the distraught man is virtually inaccessible. Extremely, extremely agitated at this time, Kate. You know, when people say, oh, that person up on the bridge, they're going to jump. Well, the cop's strapped in on the rope, or the person talking to him. It's an emergency service guy. That's how much we value the sanctity of human life. We're going up to bring that person down. Of course, we have uh, people on the uh, structure talking to this individual, and we're setting up the airbag below if he goes on the roadway, and Harbor is standing by on the water side if he goes that way. He's up on the rail now. Be the man in that guy's back. 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 After a frantic hour of attempted negotiation, it's clear that the man is so strung out that any attempted dialogue is impossible. I don't know what he's on, man, but uh, he's still going strong. Uh, he's, uh, he's addicted to marijuana cocaine. He has a marijuana cocaine addiction. The only hope lies in ESU being able to make a precarious grab. Jimmy, what's the possibility of a grab? Can you guys get on that catwalk? In a split-second maneuver, they go for it. Uh, they made the grab. They got him. And that's just a glimpse of what goes yeah. on in a situation like that. Uh, I think yeah. I think the guy in the ladder, it looked like him for a second. It looked like Vincent Dan's a little bit. It was Vinny. Yep. It was. And then yep. and the guy looking up, that looked like John Delara a little bit from the side. I don't know if that it was. It probably like, could have been if it was a triborough. Um, they could have responded from that side as well. Yep. Yeah. That, uh, that it's is interesting. When, when I was prepping for this, I was looking through some of my uh, some, you know news clips. And there was a we had a jumper on that on the triborough um, that I was on. And I remember they had a picture, and all you see is the name of, of the issue cover. It was Tommy Langone. Yeah, Tommy Langone. So uh, yep. And, yeah, and, uh, another great E-man, uh, Vincent Danz, and uh, I just mentioned as well, both both were killed on 9-11, who we'll discuss a little bit uh, later. So, you know, uh, the last scenario is, and this is why I wanted to ask you about it, when you respond to a car accident or any emergencies, you know, you were in truck two and you were in truck one, we'll discuss the truck one years later, and you're dealing with, uh, if you're in truck two, Harlem's pretty close to Brooklyn. So you got rescue two in Brooklyn of uh, the FDNY. And then obviously mm -hmm. truck one, the Hollywood truck, there's rescue one from Manhattan. Um, you know, both very elite companies. Uh, the skill set's there, but nonetheless, there's that rivalry that's there. Although I'm sure it's kind of simmered down in recent years. But when you were working, it was hot. So take me through oh, yeah. uh, yep. <laughs> the relationship with the FDNY's uh, elite rescue units. I, you know, I, it was it was definitely contentious and um you know, I, I didn't see it a lot as um, as a cop in the issue. I saw it more as a supervisor because you were kind of thrust in the middle of it. And um, a couple of things that I, and I thought, one, I think that the city did a poor job of really managing it. Um, that I meant the, the top administrators on both jobs where they could have clearly defined who has what and responsible and accountable for what. They kind of left that a gray area, which um, I guess it got us motivated but it also put us in precarious positions of, um, you know, if you have two um, elite agencies that are trying to do one thing and they start shoving each other, it doesn't end well, you know, and it, and it never, you know, where it, if it was more from the top and said, well, this is how we're going to fix it. And, and actually, I mean, the top that the mayor's office or office of emergency management had to get in because both, departments kind of dug in and said, nope, we're doing it or we're not doing it. So it was, um, you know, at times, it, but then there were other times when, um, when things went well, you know, and it's just, uh, you know, sometimes when you have um, a lot of work, um, you can, you can both work collectively, but, you know, at, at times it was just, you know, it was frustrating, put it that way. And you guys had the same equipment, too, on both trucks, you know, because as Joe Kanaski was a retired member of Rescue One. I remember him saying this in an FDNY documentary. That, except except we had guns. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, there you go. <laughs> that, that, too. That's that's the one difference is that, you know, when you're riding on these trucks, you're essentially riding on a big toolbox. 
You know, you're mm-hmm. deciding what you need for each job. And that's what makes it interesting because, you know, I asked that about Paracone. Think about the talent that Rescue One had for a while. A lot of them were not with us anymore. But, you know, guys like Dennis Mojica, Joe Angelini, Hank Malay, who's been on this show, Paul Hashagan, who will be on the show soon. I mean, there's some great guys working there. And then you got your guys. And so I guess it's kind of like a territory thing to where I, yeah, I think Paracone mentioned whoever got to the job first kind of had jurisdiction over how they were going to run it. So I, I can see right. how it would lead to a difficult situation. So before we get to your time returning to Brooklyn, um, you know, we talked earlier about career paths, and I think it's around this time that you get promoted to sergeant. So uh, did you take the test or was this because of some great things that you've done that they give it to you for that? How did that well, come I'd, I'd love to say that it was because I did great things. Nope. <laughs> Just uh, studied and uh, asked the test. That's the thing in the police department. Um, you, you can go up to the rank of captain by taking civil service, civil service exams. After that, it's, uh, it's appointment by the, by the police commissioner. But no, I did. Um, I, it was my father told me, you know, it's really kind of a boss's job. And, um, and, I, and I was very fortunate. So I, I studied hard. I took the test. Um, I, I spent a little over a year up in uh, two truck and back to two truck again before I would jump off. So my squad consisted of John Delara and George Manning. Um, John and I and George, we spent the, the better part of the year together. Um, and John, again, fantastic guy and uh, very, you know, a quirky sense of humor. Um, a lot of good John stories. Um, you know, again, you know, uh, we all know, you know, what's going to happen, you know, when he passes away on 9-11. So I get promoted um, and I end up, I go, f- you know, for my first six months where every new sergeant go probationary is to the 9-0. Um, and in, in the 9-0 um, is Williamsburg, Brooklyn. Um, it's a large contingent of basically Hasidic Jews on one side and, you know, a minority community on the other. So he had kind of um, a little bit of both going on. Um, and that's where I meet uh, Patrick Lynch. And Patrick Lynch um, ends up being my driver for the time that I'm there. So wow. me, and, me and Pat Lynch go back to, to 1989. Um, and we've stayed uh, good friends ever since. Um, and I I'll give him a plug. I think he's one of the better um, PBA presidents that they've ever had. I didn't know that. Wow. Yeah. Small world. Mm-hmm. Pat Lynch. Yep. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's, yep. that's interesting. So I think, okay. So that explains why you went back to Brooklyn. I, I think Mike Curtin did that too, because I remember reading a story about him a while ago that uh, I think he went to be a Sergeant when he got the promotion in Queens for a little bit, but he was always Correct. telling guys, not, not in a bad way, but just, you know, because he loved the emergency service unit so yep. much. I can't wait to get back to ESU. I can't wait to get, and he did. Uh, and he did some great things there uh, as we'll talk about later on. So, uh, you know, truck one, you know, on those slow days, um, mm-hmm. you would take your guys and drill them. And that segues perfectly into my next question, because you want to make sure you keep the men sharp. You want to make sure that they're ready for anything. For you as a boss, if you had to say you were a sergeant for a long time, what makes not just an effect, effective sergeant, but an effective leader, period? Well, it's, it's interesting. I thought about this and, and, I've, and I often told um newer sergeants and even cops i said if if you can't make decisions or unwilling to make decisions you're in the wrong unit if you're if you're here to wait for say for a, as a sergeant wait for the lieutenant or the captain to go to make that decision you're in the wrong unit you're here to lead men the men are going to look up to you the men and women are going to look up to you to make that decision and to do things um and we don't do it reckless we don't do it you know we you know we talked about um you know chief Anamon. Uh, we knew him as an inspector and he would say, John, are we good with this? And meaning that we're going to be able to do what we just said to do and everybody's going to be safe. And you'd have to be able to look him and, you know, Chief Anamon to be able to look him in the eye and say, yes, Chief, at the, at the time inspector, yes, we're good. And we, we can do this and we're going to get it done. Um, so that's what I was saying. And I, I often told cops, I said, you know, um, you can, it's great bringing a set of skill sets. You're a mechanic, you're this, you're that. One of the things that I often said, I, I really love to have a good street cop and then we can mold them in. We can give you those other train. I can, we can train you how to open an elevator. The things that sometimes we can't train you is that the, the sense of how to be on the street because you're still, regardless, you drive around this big rec- rescue truck, you're still a cop. You still, you know, things happen and people are going to look. They're not going to say that, oh, wait, you know, you, you do just SWAT work and rescue. You don't just do what's happening right in front of you. No, you have to do this. So, um, again, being a being a very good, you know, a cop and 
the, the other thing is what I've seen, there was a, a, an old timer, George Toth. Uh, George Toth did, I think, 38 years, to 30, 40 years, 35 or more in emergency service. And that guy, when, when he would see you doing something, he would come over and go, hey, what is that? Always willing to learn. He never looked at you and said, hey, kid, you know, you should have been here 10 years ago. You don't know what you're talking about. So, you know, the ability to learn, be a good street cop and be, be willing to make a decision. Be willing to adapt on the fly, because I think I think yep. in anything that you do, the point over like, for example, this is a much different comparison. This show I look I listen back to the interviews I recorded when I was 17, 18. And I'm like, Ugh. You know, because it's just, I was so new at it. I thought I was great, but I listened back. I'm like, no, we're, we're going to, we're going to forget that ever happened. And, you know, I haven't been at this long. I'm only 21, but I can kind of take pride in the fact that, you, you know, you continue to evolve over mm-hmm. time and get better at your craft. And as you, you never plateau, I don't think in police work or in fire service work either. And even in retirement, you still take those lessons with you. So that's a, it's a very good thing. Um, I'll jump in. I, let me just jump in on what you said with that, because that's what some of you always did. So with similar the way every truck is set up um, in, in there, they have in the back, there's a kitchen set up with a kitchen table. And that is the, the meeting place after any, almost any big job or almost any job. So you go back in there and you critique it. And that's where that, that area there um, kind of, I wouldn't call it sacred, it's kind of a weird, but that was a free zone. So if I did something as a sergeant that was dangerous, the guys knew they would, they'd say, you shouldn't have done that, but this should have happened this way. It was separate from what you see in, in the precincts where it was that rank structure. You wouldn't just go up to you know, a ranking officer and say, hey, you know, you screwed up out there. Um, but within emergency service, to your point, is, is like when you reviewed your podcast, we review these higher jobs and say, OK, how could we have done it better? What could we have done safer? What could we have done differently? Because, like you said, none of this, we're, we learn all the time um, on how to do things. And last thing I'll say on that is, you know, back to when you talked about the, the cause and extrication. So I had a visiting professor at one time coming in and he was doing a ride along with me and we were talking about it. He said, why don't you guys just do traditional spot work? And I said, you know, I said, it, it can work for some. But what I found, my feeling is, is that when you have guys that do traditional SWAT work, you train just kind of the same way, the same thing all the time. And I use the analogy for a car. You have a car that's in a crash and you have to use, you know, the, the hearse tool and, you know, to extricate them. There's a thousand different ways to do it. And I said, so what you're doing is you're getting these guys to think. You're thinking of different things. You're thinking of different solutions as opposed to, hey, we always hit the door. We always go right. So now that when you take that mentality with you and you're doing a warrant, you hit the door and you're like, well, the undercover said that there was a straight hallway, but it's not. It's been barricaded off. But you you practice it. You know this and you just think and you say, OK, well, let me go left. Let me do something different. You don't get caught up. Well, we've always trained this way. So, you know, and that's why, you know, the the blend of the way that we do emergency service work here in the city that doing technical rescue as well as SWAT, I think is a benefit for the cops and as well as the department and the, uh, the city that they serve. And the Limerick for ESU is this, or the motto for ESU is this, and John Lampkin is our guest here in the Mike I guess I'm really glad John's on. I'm having a lot of fun talking with him. Uh, is when a cop, when a, somebody, when a civilian needs help, they call a cop. When a cop needs help, they call ESU. And that's why. And I believe in, in the, just for my listeners, I'd like to provide context for the origins of ESU because I heard this. And if I'm not right, again, um, please stop me because you know more than I do about this, is year, decades ago, um, Fiorello LaGuardia was mayor at the time. So this is like the 30s. He was having a spat with the fire department and obviously nothing against the fire department. They're great too. But I think it was over certain jobs that they were saying at the time, oh, this is not in our purview, we only handle fires. And so for when somebody gets stuck on a high rise or something like that, that's not what we do. And I think it was that that provided the door for Fiorello LaGuardia to say, okay, well, let's have the police do it and set it. And thus emergency service was born. Do I have that correct? Yeah, I think so. I think it is, uh, you know, originally they, they were, I think what they called them, the Tommy gun squad, that they had the old Thompson 45 submachine guns and, um, and oxygen. And um, they did things like that. And, and certainly as it grew and evolved, um, I, I think, again, 
on so many things that they did and so many of the talented people that have gone through that had added their little things to it. Um, I, I think he was spot on by, by creating this unit. I think we just had our 80 something birthday. I can't, can't remember. It, um, it's been a long time. Yep. Mm-hmm. And it's a, and it's a rich history and training Manhattan is so different because I mean, yeah, you were in Harlem and now in truck one, you're like in the thick of downtown. And so I mentioned the high rises Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, you're repelling down the sides of these things, not just to get suicidal people, but, you know, I, I always cite this line because it was actually, Paul, I heard it from Paul Hassagan, which was New York City would be a nice place if they ever finish it. That's Mark Twain. Right? And so right. they're always doing construction. Somebody's, you know, and so naturally, sometimes you get the window watchers, they get stuck up there and, mm-hmm. or an elevator gives out. And, you know, doing that, going up the side of a 50 story building. Um, I, I hate to put you through every drill. It's just, I really love this stuff. So that kind of, that kind of training, take me through what, what goes into that. So for me, because I like the, um, I like the view, uh, we did our Sunday training on uh, the Brooklyn bridge, uh, because you could get to do both. You get to do the climb the cables as well. And then we would get up to the top and we would throw the rope bag down and we would repel down onto the walkway. Um, you know, and, you think of it and it's, you know, we think of it as just like, a, it's a fun day, um, you know, to be able to do this. And it's, um, it, you know, it, it encompasses, you get to use all your different training skills of, of doing it. And that comes in when you're actually on a job and, you know, you have to remember how to do these things under pressure, you know, and, and that's the, the key to it. You know, we also had a, a jet ski that was docked over on 23rd street. Um, so I would say that, you know, we, we, we did some levels of training there and, um, I think that it was more for our our own enjoyment, you know, up and down the Hudson river, um, on a Friday afternoon, but it was, uh, as we called it surface water training. Absolutely. And, uh, that is, listen, anything, anything that you can learn as we were just, as we just finished talking about anything that you can learn, um, is going to be beneficial in the long run. It goes perfectly into my next question as well is that, uh, the bomb squad and the emergency service unit work hand in hand. I think through my mini series mm-hmm. with the bomb squad, you find that out. And a lot of guys from ESU like Paracone go into the bomb squad. And, and, and there's many other stories similar to his as well. Um, you know, on suspicious packages, that, that, that documentary I, I showed earlier, there's a clip earlier in the documentary where Sergeant Bob Masucci uh, responds uh, and the cordons off an area. So the bomb squad mm-hmm. can go in and look at some phony device training with them. Uh, when did that start? Did that start prior to 1993 or did that start after oh, yeah. the Trade Center bombing in 93? Oh, no. Well, way before. Um, and again, that was uh, for most, for a lot of emergency guys, again, we'll go back to the, the inability to get the, you know, the gold shield, the investigator and the extra money that goes with that. So in the 70s, 80s or whatever, they cops in emergency, then they're, maybe they're near retirement. They're like, well, I, I want to get, go, go out as an investigator. So let me go switch over to the bomb squad. And if, and if you look at the bomb squad, it's a lot of technical stuff. It's a lot of hands-on stuff. You know, certainly there's a lot of knowledge base, but it's the similar what, um, what emergency service has done. So it's kind of an easy switch over to put them in there, you know, and granted, they, do they do maybe long tail investigations on after the post bomb and, and things like that? I, yeah, absolutely. Um, but I think it's, uh, so that level of training was always there and it was, we were the only ones basically were able to get into that little inner circle to help them dress, you know, um, and, and to be able to work with them. And also for the emergency service, we're the ones that carried the bomb. So they would put it in. So in truck two, we had um, what's called a TCV, a total containment vessel, that if there was an actual device, we would drive this down and was hooked up to our smaller car, the radio emergency patrol car, the REP, and the bomb squad would put that in, seal it, and then, we would drive it up to the range. When we get up to the range, you know, an escort up there, they would then, you know, we would park it where they have their, you know, their bunker and they would take that out and then they would do whatever they needed to do to diffuse it or, um, or to explode it. So yeah, it was, um, it was definitely a hand in hand um, type thing. Sure. Because I, when, when our friend Dan McNally was on the show, um, I showed a clip of, uh, of, it was 1995. It was a documentary they were shooting on EMS before they merged with the FKNY in 96. Mm -hmm. And the late Dan Richards is the one that comes out of the tunnel uh, after working on a a phony device. And the guys, I mean, yeah, he has McNally and a detective by the name of Tom Connolly waiting for him. But the guys are helping Danny take off the suit. 
is our ESU guys, you know, and they're the ones that right. have the street court and off. So I always wanted to ask about them because as you, as you, and you did a great job of explaining it because it is an interesting relationship. And I imagine even if you do have this specialized truck, when you're carrying something like that, that if it goes off, could kill you. I mean, that had to put some sweat on your brow when you were driving into the range of the Bronx. Yeah. You, you know, I guess, I guess you think back of it now, but when you think of it there, um, you know, it, it, it's similar to, when you're up on the bridge and you have, you know, you're tied in, you trust your equipment. Mm-hmm. So when you trust the equipment, you trust that this TCV is going to contain whatever's in there. Um, and yeah, you know, I'll, I'll go to I'll put an analogy with the, the jump. We had a jumper where we had a guy who was up there. And this was one time that I really thought I was going to go over the side of the bridge. So we, it was a late night. It was, um, you know, so we're on our knees. He's perched at the, you know, right at the tip. And I knew that if I was to grab him, my momentum would probably carry me over the side of the tower. You know, that caused that actually caused me concern. You know, as as I've driven the TCV and I was less concerned, I'm like, well, is my rope going to hold? Is the guy behind me going to make sure that he's going to, you know, my belay guy going to stop me? And is this momentum going to take me further than where I really want to go? But fortunately, I didn't. I got to this, you know, just to the side and we were able to pull him in. But again, it comes back to, you know, um, you know, the people that you're with, you, you know, your skill sets and you trust your equipment. I'm talking with John Lanton here in the Mike Haven podcast. And now this clip does feature you, you explaining what goes into the NYPD's emergency service unit. Let's take it back to uh, 2002. Arlene Harrison, president of Gramercy yep. Park Association, uh, put together this lovely little feature on the e and here is Sergeant John Lampy. Coming cool and collected, and they went about their business. And without fanfare, they, they went and they, you know, they completed it, which was great. Um, and you know, you looked at them, and they were like, you know, you know, this was the place to come to come and uh, and really kind of do, you know, like wild police work. The workhorse of the division is the REP, which is the smaller of the two. The uh, the heavy rescue or the big truck, or it's, it's termed a few things by different people, but it is a larger vehicle carrying some of the same equipment that could be utilized for any and all applications of the calls for service that we receive. We have everything from a Hearst rescue tool to get people out of motor vehicles when they're trapped after a collision. We have scuba equipment. We have small hand tools from screwdrivers to pliers and all those other things, including an elevator kit. So we have just about everything we need, including animal control, um, water rescue equipment, just uh, just what we would need in the immediate call to service in the initial stages, and then the other vehicle, the, the, the big truck will come in with the supervisor and with additional equipment help us to accomplish the goal. It's a little throwback there. Hope you enjoyed that. Any comment on the video? Oh, a lot. Uh, one, Mike Hansen. Um, Mike Hansen, uh, fantastic guy. Meet, you know, uh, Mike was a, a, a staple in emergency. He died uh, two I think it was three years ago, he died from 9-11 related illness. Um, Mike, and there was another fellow, Charlie Delaccio, we were home that day, and I guess we'll get to that story shortly. Uh, we drove in together on 9-11. Um, you know, so, but I'll, I, let me jump into Arlene. Arlene was fantastic. Um, she really did, and she still does to this day, um, look after, um, you know, the guys in emergency service. And I think she's also working with the Blue Line now. Um, to make sure that people get what they need, you know, afterwards. She was very instrumental when, um, you know, during, right after the Trade Center, we would go back to the 13th Precinct where our quarters was, and there'd be food, there'd be, you know, clothing, things like that. Um, and she, she put, she organized the entire uh, Gramsci Park neighborhood to, to supply this between the 13th Precinct and us um, so, we can, so we can continue to do the mission down at Ground Zero. And there's a lot of beautiful tributes on there. I mean, there's a tribute to the guys in Truck 2, Truck 1, Brian McDonald, Steve Driscoll, Benny Dance. Uh, she even did a feature, even though it wasn't, he wasn't an E-man, doesn't matter, he was still a hero. 
uh, Dan Richards, he went and she went and did a feature on. She's put it down with Jim Carano, Michael Mixon, and uh, Steve Berber, and she did a uh, feature so on him. What that what that was? So she had come to me, and there was a, um, a film director, and he said, you know, they wanted to do this this type, you know, to memorialize, and it, and it was up to me to sell it to the guys and the men and women of emergency because they, you know, again, they didn't think it, they didn't want it to be out there for public. And it wasn't, this went to the families. Um, for the, so we went around to every truck and we sat with the, the men and women um, and it was good, but it was tough um, because I went to every truck with this crew and we sat, you know, we talked about all the losses, you know, and, and all the, all those that, um, you know, and their personal stories. Um, yeah, you know, so it was, um, I'm glad that we did it. And I think the families are appreciative. Um, I hope they are, I, uh, you know, and, um, you know, I, and I think it's a way to kind of, you know, to, to help grieve and to get past, you know, not past, but just to help grieve and, and, and deal with the, you know, the whole 9-11 issues. Of course. And I, I think it's good for even people like us that don't have a direct link to it, because part of the reason you and I are having this conversation is through watching those clips. Part of the reason I've gotten to know some of the Bomb Squad guys is by watching those clips and learning more about Dan. So it, it's helpful because it I, we talked about this off the air. It allows us, my generation, to empathize a little bit better uh, with what you guys were going through at that time. So let's get to that day. Um, you were home, you were off duty, and it, then you hear the news. Take it from there. Uh, so we'll back up a day. Uh, so September 10th, I was in uh, one truck and I was doing a four to 12. Actually, was scheduled to do a day tour on 9-11. 9-11 is my son's birthday. My son was going to turn eight years old that day. Um, and I was in the midst of painting a couple of rooms within my house. I since, you know, had I just the year before I had moved out of Brooklyn up to Orange County. So in prepping for the party, I said, well, I was going to do the day tour and then I'll go home after, you know, on nine 11 and we'll do a birthday party for my son. So around nine o'clock on September 10th, I called the desk and I said, you know, what kind of coverage you have tomorrow? And they said, well, Sarge, we got coverage, which, you know, it means all the, all the trucks in the North are covered. There's sergeants, there's plenty of people, nothing is going on. Take the day. So I take the day off. Um, I go home and just when, when you, if you were going to work out of tour, out of squad, um, what they would do typically is they would fly you the next day. If I was working a day tour, they would fly me to whatever truck didn't have a sergeant. And at that time, it would be across the bridge over into a truck. So as, as we see, I'll, I'll jump back a little bit. So while I'm home, my son's out going out to, to, um, out to school. The first plane had already hit. And I'm sitting there and saying, wow, I, I actually just said, the boys are going to be busy today because they were still trying to figure it out. Small plane, big plane, you know, and I remember standing in my kitchen looking at the TV and I watched the second plane hit. And once that hit, I picked up the phone. As I mentioned, I called Mike Hansen and Charlie Delaccio. I said, let's go. We got to go to work, grab a lot of stuff because we're going to be there for a few days. Um, probably within five, 10 minutes, I was out the door. I went to Charlie's first. Then we picked up Mike and we flew down Route 17, um, which people, you can really get the sense that people knew something really bad was happening because people got out of the way, you know, and I've been a cop at this point for what, 19 years. And you have a big rescue truck with lights and siren and they don't get out of your way. I had, I'm driving down in my, um, whatever sedan I had with a small bubble light, people get out of the way. So, it, you know, you got the sense that it was best. So as we're getting towards, we're listening to the radio, you know, the regular um, radio, we get to the George Washington Bridge and we're hearing reports that the tower is down. And what we are thinking is that, well, the top, maybe a piece come down, you know, the top comes down or, you know, we, but you look south down um, the Hudson and you just see black. Uh, so we, we arrive at, uh, we fly down the, you know, the west, uh, the east side, we, we arrive at one truck in the 13th precinct. They mobilized as well. They had vans waiting because they knew this is what we do. So they were like, we got a van ready. You just get in. We're going to fly you down to, um, down to the trade center. So we grabbed enough gear 
rescue gear. Our, you know, we use uh, Maracas uh, and uh, Roco climbing gear with personal climbing gear. We put all that in and we flew down to, um, down to grounds here, down to the trade center. And this is after, is this after the North Tower had fallen or was it still standing at Correct. this point? Yep. No, both towers were down. Um, and at this point, um, we, we get down and we're trying to, what they're doing is so, Inspector Ronnie Watson, who was uh, the right man for the right job at that time down there to be the inspector of the CO of emergency, he grabs me and says, John, we got to assemble down at North Cove. We need to do is a return roll call. We need to find out where our people are and who's still here. So I, we, we get everybody as we moving down, but we just jump up. So when I first get down there, I see Mark DeMarco. And Mark DeMarco, um, he was in with um, John DeLara, uh, Billy Bury, uh, Claude Richards, Mike uh, Curtin, when the towers came down, he was going into the customs house. Mark, and we'll talk about in a bit, gets saved. So I see Mark, and Mark is what we used to call as a consummate man. He, he never got rattled or anything. And, um, and, and he comes to me, and, you know, and I see him, and, and he just looks at me and goes, John, it's bad. And it just, it stunned me. And it just, I was like, wow. I said, that's like chilled me, you know, and I was like, okay. So then we go to um, North Cove. So we get to the North Cove and we do what's called this, this return roll call. So we're basically lining them up by trucks, you know, one truck, two, three. And as we go through it, we have, I have someone next to me calling for the missing, you know, to see if we can get them. And we, we don't, you know, you don't hear it. You know, you, you, you get no response. So once we kind of we figured out who we have and who we're missing, and then we start to form up into uh, rescue squads. I remember being, I remember listening to, I think it was uh, a clip that was paying tribute to Sergeant Rod Gillis that there was a point because the, the guy that was the lieutenant in charge of ESU that day was Vic Hollyfield, uh, who was mm -hmm. another guy that's on my list and I'll try to get him soon. Um, that day, uh, at that point, they had this North Tower still standing. They had reached out to Sergeant Gillis over the radio and had and had heard anything. And they tried to page Sergeant John Coughlin, hadn't heard anything from him either. And they paged yep. for Sergeant Curtin. And that's when Sergeant Curtin says, Well, I think I'm on the third floor. I'll be out in a moment. And he did get out. I, I think Joe Vigiano stayed behind with Brian McDonald to, to perform. I think so. Rescue. Yep. They, they were they were finishing up and as they were coming down, um, you know, and, and there's, there's a few stories like that. I know the, the, the team from uh, one truck led by Dominic Mendelari was passing um, a, group, a group of firemen. And they said, you know, we've just got the order to, to get out. And this, and the order to get out is done by Kenny Winkler. Um, and, you know, if, if you don't have any, if you don't have him on your list, you, you really do need to. Kenny Winkler, okay. basically he, he saved uh, many, many people. He's a hero of mine. Um, you know, he, he was, he was scheduled to go home that morning. He goes down there and there's an iconic picture of, of you see a, a, an E-man on a radio, you see in the forefront, there's a guy who's bewildered because the building's coming down and you see this guy in a pair of shorts, that's Kenny. And, and Kenny in the midst of all this chaos was radioing in to get all these guys out. Um, and ensure, and even for people coming in, there were guys that were coming in and said, well, I'm just going to go in and meet up the screw. He said, absolutely not. Nobody's going in until I tell you where to go and what to, you know, what to do. So, um, highly, you know, you, you definitely need to, uh, and want to speak with Kenny and then yeah. Kenny and I, so I meet up with Kenny after we do the return roll call and we work together for, for the rest of the day and we'll end up working together to, um, with the Port Authority rescue. At this point, it's, it's a chaotic scene. The FDNY has a lot of guys missing. The NYPD mm -hmm. has a lot of guys missing. The Port Authority Police has a lot of guys missing. Um, you have to establish control, though, because otherwise the rescue mission is not going to flow. But in the midst of this, um, there are two Port Authority police officers who are trapped alive. They were in the lobby of the North Tower. They hopped into an elevator shaft, which saved their lives. Um, Jimeno and McLaughlin. Um, and you were among the rescuers of them. Uh, take me through Correct. that story. Um, so in, I guess it's around 8.30, um, you know, and, and we've, we've been trying to do what we typically do on, you know, any, any kind of collapses, look for voids. So 
we heard from somebody that, hey, they think there's two guys that are trapped, you know, at, you know up on, on the pile. Um, so the first up is Scotty Strauss and, um, and Patty McGee. So they radio down. He goes, yes, we do. We, there's a Port Authority cop that's trapped. So, and we start coordinating, getting the tools, the water, the rescue equipment. Well, Scott Strauss, again, another one you should make sure you put on your list. Um, Scott ends up crawling next to Willie, um, literally using a small hand shovel in his hand to continually to dig out um, and to try to, to access to him. And then we also had, uh, there was a paramedic, um, his name escapes me right now, but he was another E-man. He went down in there and he actually was able to put a, uh, an IV in to help uh, Willie. That rescue takes all, we, we were there from about 8.30 to about two o'clock in the morning when they finally were able to free um, Willie to come out and, and remember moving you know, the, the stretcher by hand down the line. Everybody passed it down where he was able to be taken to the hospital. And then it took another maybe 10 hours to get to John McLaughlin. They had a, we had another group that came in around two in the morning and they took over to do that because the, the guys within right there, because you have to, you have to understand that they're down into this area where they were and it's still a blast furnace. There's smoke, there's fire. The, you know, during the, you know, the afternoon of five o'clock, the building seven comes down. Um, you just hear things that are, you know, we're out there. And I, and I kind of kiddingly at one point I turned to Kenny and I said, um, is you're the fate, you're the last person I'm going to see on this earth. You, you know, we kind of laughed about it. Um, but, but you know, you're out there and you're in the open and you're choking on smoke. I mean, this is, you know, you, you generally don't do that. Usually in a smoke condition, you're in some, some enclosed place, but it was that, that intense, um, that, that, uh, that, that level of smoke and stuff. So, and I, and I can't thank you enough for being here. I, I, I'll, I'll try to, uh, I, won't, I don't want to keep you too long. You're so generous with your time and I appreciate you being here. Um, at this point, we, you know, and I, I want to have this conversation. I mean, maybe there's a sliver of hope after finding those two alive that you would find more guys alive. Of course, you got several patrol officers missing. I'm pretty sure mm-hmm. those who work with officers, Leahy, Smith, Fazio, Perry, uh, that's just some of the ones I can name. They want to know, well, what about our colleagues? The bomb squad wants to know about Danny. And then there's your guys yep. in the SU. Um, did that provide some brief glimmer of hope that you would be able to find well, the other you know, ones alive? It, it, I, absolutely. And, and I think for, for us, um, psychologically, it, it helped because we were able to be you know, part of um, you know, unfortunately the last rescue of, of people alive. So there's, there's a, you know, it, 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 it definitely helped us, but during the, the next several days and you see the extent of it. Um, and one of the things that I often tried to do is we would go to, um, to one police plaza after the day and we would speak to the family and, uh, you know, to try to, to try to give them as best hope that we can do. And it was interesting. It was Maggie McDonald said to me once, uh, Brian's wife, and she said, you know, just having you here. And she said, she goes, she's going, this is going to sound weird. She goes, but you smell like Brian, you know? So it, within emergency service, they, they used it as an industrial pine cleaner to clean everything. You know, we did our own clean. And whenever you came home to do more, that you had that, that, that scent of this. And she said, she goes, I, I can smell the pine that Brian would have when he would come home. You know, so and we would make sure to do that. And then as the days went on and we I got to work with um, we got to work with some specialists from out in California that did, you know, earthquakes and, and everything else. And I remember there was one fellow there who was on the Northridge earthquake. And he said, he goes, I've never seen in my 30 years of working earthquake can be to see an area as compacted as this, because the way everything came down on itself. So. It, it doesn't give you more hope to do that. And one of the things that I ended up doing, um, I forget what day it was, maybe six days or so into it, I made it a point to go to the bomb squad because when we first started doing our search, we concentrated on the uh, customs house. And the customs house, as you know, that was where, you know, even Mike Curtin and um, the, um, you know, Danny Richards and Mark DeMarco. So Mark was able to tell me and John DeLauro too. Me this, and John DeLara of where they were and where he was able to get out. And after spending so much time there, um, it was kind of evident. And I know, you know, listen, the, the bomb squad guys, they're cops, they're emergency guys. And I went and I said, listen, I said, you know, 
I'm not here to be the bear of just bad news, but I said, it, you know, this is a recoveries now. I, I said, you know, we, this is what, this is what we're seeing. And, you know, they, they thanked me. They were like, you know, because they, they weren't getting there. You know, they, they would come in and volunteer. They do some, you know, the bucket brigade or something else, but we were on the interior team search teams and see, and this is what we were seeing. So I, you know, I, I didn't, wasn't filtering it out. I said, listen, this is, this is what we're seeing. And, um, you know, and this is, you know, it's, it's not going to be good news. You know, this, like, if you look at the, the surf side collapse now where there was, there was a lot of voids. Um, but even that, they're not finding, you know, they're not, they're not finding anybody. Um, well, certainly now they're not, but they didn't find many people alive. Oh, it's just, uh, I remember somebody saying, well, the hope is, okay, well, maybe they just slid down a slab. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I think we would all, in a situation like that, hope for that because you cling to anything that you can in that moment, you know. But um, mm -hmm. you, you saw it very early on. And of course, these, Sergeant Curtin was found March 6, 2002. Uh, that I mentioned uh, numerous times on my show when I interviewed the bomb squad guys, they, they found Danny March 29th. Um, and they found John seven months, seven months of the day, actually, April 11th of, yeah. of 2002. And I imagine that that had to provide some sort of solace, at least to be able to find them in that rubble. Oh, oh absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Um, you know, it's, uh, you know, and I, and I think of this every time, um, you know, a, uh, the, um, the anniversary comes around. It's the, it's the families. I mean, it, we feel it. And I can only imagine how, um, how, how it's to the families of they, you know, it's, it's, you know, you, you kind of bring this back up again. So, you know, heart goes out to them um, that we, yeah. we do try to make sure that we're, we're there for them as best that we can, you know. Absolutely. You sent me some photos that I do want to share because there's an interesting story to each of them. And, and for those of you that will watch on YouTube, you'll see these. But for those that will listen, I'll try to describe them. And Sergeant Lampkin, of course, will as best he can. Um, there are three photos. Let me just edit the screen here. Um, mm -hmm. And just just take me through each of these. Sure. Well, the, the first one here was just um, so I took this, uh, I guess, like, what's the date the, the 11th or so um or the, the 17th 9th. it says the seven the 17th yep so we were back in with mark demarco um so if you see in the middle of the wall it seems like a gloved hand and and it, mark has takes us through it. he says when he he goes in and down at the bottom he just kind of crawls and the buildings come down on you see on the right that whole opening that's where the tower comes crashing through he gets covered with dirt he puts his hand up and he gets on the wall and he says, I just go left. He goes, I don't know why. He says, it's pitch black. I'm choking on, on the, the, the dust, the smoke. He goes left. If you see where, you know, he could have taken a step or two to the right, he would have, he would have died. He would have fell off into, you know, down into that pit. So he just goes and he just goes to the left, which, you know, divine intervention. I don't know. So here, this is this is the step that he would have, that he could have taken had he just said, "Well, I have to go to the right." Um, and this is the, the the building. If you see some of the the beams, and I think this is where they came up with the the, the crosses. Where you see some of the cross sections look like like crosses. But this is the tower that came through. Um, that you know, one minute you know that building was there, and and then next you have you know Billy uh, Bury and Mark DeMarco. Uh, really the only left out of that whole group that was, you know, once right behind them. We'll go to the final photo. And that is this one. Yep. And, and this is where he has to traverse all the way down to basically where the other cop is standing. And then that gets him out to West street um, where they had put up a ladder and he was able to walk down, walk down the ladder. And, um, you know, subsequently we met up on um i think west and Vessi a little bit i never saw the inside of the, of the customs house because i have heard the descriptions of what have happened because uh, you know i i in the, within that there were eight guys in that group there were two cops from port authority emergency services um that that we i never got their names from it but they're bill Bury, mark demargo mike Curtin, uh mm -hmm. john delara dan mcnally and dan richards and i think it was right. the way that they described it is it was just a matter of where you were standing and that when the rumbling of the collapse started, I don't know if this is why the handprints were in the wall. They all leaned up against the wall to try to steady right. themselves as it was coming down. So I, 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 I now you explained it. That's like, that's, I, I want to word this as delicately as possible. That is a horrifying way to die. 
That is that yeah. is that that is a yep. terrifying way to. Mm-hmm. I can't even. Ugh, I can't even imagine something like that. But the, the you know, and I, I want to get to this, and I guess we can. Uh, I I would normally conclude with a segment called Rapid Fire. We may get to it here, but I think that the way this conversation has gone, and it's been a great conversation. I want to focus on these fourteen men because mm-hmm. we know, as I told you off the air, we can we know how they died, but. They lived such incredible lives and did such incredible yep. things. And you worked hand in hand with them and, and had that opportunity to, to get to know them really well. The stories are amazing. Walter Reaver was an expert with animals. You know, Jerome mm-hmm. Dominguez worked yep. himself into the best physical shape of his life to get there. Joe Vigiano shot three times, uh, still came back to work work each time. Uh, you know, Rod Gillis had a great smile by all accounts that could light up Manhattan. Yep. John Coughlin was a housing cop that when he came into the NYPD with the merger, worked his way up from housing ESU into the NYPD's ESU. So there's great stories. And I, I could sit here and blab, but nobody wants to hear that. Tell me about the stories of these incredible but, Yeah, I, you know, and, and that's, uh, that, you know, part of why we did those videos to, to capture those stories, um, you know, because there's, in each truck, they, 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 they brought something, you know, these, these guys. Um, I, I don't know if you can see it. I think this, if... Yes, I can see it. For my listeners, I'll describe it. It is a photo yep. with the Twin Towers in the background um, and an E-man standing on the bridge. That's, what, that's Wally Weaver. Wally with a Weaver. smile and a half. And, um, you know, I, I was given that picture, you know, and here's, here's this young kid um, who couldn't be happier. He's in emergency service. You know, he's, you know, here he is. Um, but all of them, you know, and they all had lives to live. They had families. Um, you know, and this is why, you know, I do things like this. This is why... You know, after 9-11, me and Kenny Winkler, we did um, three presentations. Um, we were down in Virginia. We were down in Illinois. We were over in Illinois. As hard as it is to do it, it's we're speaking for them because they can't speak anymore. You know, we're hope that we can continue to um, share their stories and keep their memories going um, because they deserve it. You know, they, they, were, they were tremendous people. Absolutely. I guess we can get to the rapid fire and, and I want to thank you for coming on. So what this is, is this concluding segment of the podcast and uh, mm-hmm. it is five hit and run questions for me, five answers for me. Are you ready? Yep. All right. So here we go. First favorite tool to use during your ESU years. Wow. The MP5. And, oh, hey, that's it. That is, uh, <laughs> that's the ones you see in the movies. That is the big guns right yep. there. Second, I, I all, I'll ask you the thing you missed the most, but there's, I mean, uh, uh, Jim Carano had a great line when he was on. He said that uh, I miss the clowns in the circus, but I don't miss the circus <laughs> per se. When you look back, uh, what's the thing you don't miss about the NYPD? Oh, the administrative nonsense. Um, absolutely. You know, that's uh, more of the paperwork. Okay. And third thing, yep. the third thing, what do you miss the most? Oh, the, the, the excitement of it, um, like we, we talked about just the, you know, even the training to be up on the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, if you've, you've never stood on the Brooklyn Bridge at night overlooking Manhattan, you're missing something. All right, I, well, don't I go would, up there. Well, don't no, go up there. You know, no, no, I'm not, I'm, I'm not. I'm afraid of heights. I would never. Uh, but I can. Mm-hmm. I would love to take the walk. I, I'll hopefully be back in the city soon. Uh, fifth and finally, what advice would you give to anybody coming on the job now? Um. Just be uh, be careful. It's a uh, you know it's a dangerous job out there. Um, it's um, uh, you know it's it, nowadays with cameras and everything. You you just have to really know what you're doing. Um, uh, you know we used to have a line in emergency. You know your job, do your job. Um, and, and that's the best I can say is just to be uh, you know uh, be proficient in what you do. Study hard. Make make boss and, and stay safe. And that has concluded what has been a very fun episode of the Mike Navy podcast to do. I can't thank you enough for coming on. I really appreciate you making the time for me. Sure. Uh, we yep. like to uh, promote ourselves before we go. So if there's, you know, if the people don't know where to find John Lampkin, where can they find him? Well, I'm on LinkedIn, um, uh, but it's um, not so much me. Uh, remember the people, remember falling, um, do something for this 9-11, um, you know, either go down to the Memorial Wall down in uh, North Cove, um, so the, the tower to tower is still a fund donate to them they do some great work um, Arlene Harrison I'll give her a plug she's done some amazing stuff um, and as well as the, the blue line so but like I said it's um, I'm here as just a messenger it's not me but you know whatever they can do to, to try to remember the uh, those that were lost on 
Absolutely. On my end, if you don't know where to find me by now, for all my listeners out there, here's where you can find me in the event you're listening for the first time. Twitter, at Mike in New Haven. LinkedIn, Mike Cologne. Type in Mike Cologne, M-I-C apostrophe D for the podcast, of course, Mike in New Haven. Uh, and then you'll be able to connect with me, of course. And uh, Instagram, I am original underscore MC1. If you have any sports-related inquiries, for the podcast, my business line on the sports end is 917-727-0891, or you can email me, Cologne on sports, C-O-L-O-N on sports at gmail.com. Any other podcast-related inquiries, whether it be news, the fire service, law enforcement, or whatever the case may be, ring me up at 917-781-6189, or email me, the Cologne Report, T-H-E-C-O-L-O-N report at gmail.com. Of course, this YouTube, uh, you can find me, MC's Audio, MC Apostrophe S Audio, and subscribe to me there. And we are everywhere you get your podcast. If you're in the car, put me on. I'm not that terrible, and the guests are great. Uh, so be sure to subscribe to me on those fronts. Coming up on the Mike Canadian Podcast, uh, we have next week, Ron Rose, retired lieutenant, worked in the anti money laundering division. Interesting guy. Going to be an interesting guest for a great show. And of course, uh, coming up on Tuesday of next week, August 3rd, Dan McNally makes his triumphant return to the Mike Game podcast as we continue Tales from the Boom Room, profiles the NYPD's arson explosion bomb squad. Why? Because Dan is going to give his insight into the investigation of the 1996 TWA Flight 800 crash. He has some thoughts, and it's going to be fun to hear them. So with all that being considered and said, hope to see you then. Hope you enjoyed this episode. And on behalf of retired NYPD ESU Sergeant John Lampkin, I am Mike Cologne, and we will see you next time. Take care, everyone.